Greetings. Uh, let me share with you what I have learned from the recent American Journal of Gastroenterology guidelines published in 2021 on the management of peptic ulcer bleeding. When a patient presents to the emergency room with upper GI bleeding, either in the form of hematemesis or melena, you have a lot of work cut out for you. The first step is to assess the hemodynamics and also check for comorbid illnesses. Patient can come in with hematemesis who could be completely stable with no changes in the vital signs and otherwise healthy. That is one type of patient. You could also have a patient who comes in with a hematemesis with a low blood pressure and tachycardia. That is an unstable patient who may be otherwise healthy. A third patient could be, patient comes in with hematemesis but has underlying liver disease and in that case the patient belongs to somebody who is hemodynamically stable but has underlying serious comorbid disease. And the fourth patient could be somebody who comes in with hematemesis, has a low blood pressure, and also has a serious underlying comorbid illness, such as heart failure or liver failure. So these four patients' management differs. And after your initial assessment, you should also look at the hemoglobin level and the BUN and try to figure out the Glasgow Blatchford score. A young patient who comes in with hematemesis but has no melena and has no comorbid illnesses his vital signs are stable and his hemoglobin and BUN are normal, has a Glasgow Blatchford score of less than one. Depending upon the social circumstances and the local services that are available and access to healthcare, one could consider discharging that patient as long as that patient could be seen without losing for follow-up in, in the next few days. On the other hand, if the patient comes in with hematemesis, melena, has any features of hemodynamic decompensation with tachycardia and hypotension, and if they have any serious comorbid illness, or if the hemoglobin has dropped and the BUN has risen, that patient has an elevated Glasgow Blatchford score and should be admitted. While you're figuring out and assessing the hemodynamics and the comorbid illness status, you should quickly start resuscitation of the patient with crystalloids and also arrange for transfusion. At the same time, manage the comorbid conditions. As soon as you get your hemoglobin, the recent uh, guidelines suggest that if a healthy person who doesn't have any serious underlying cardiac disease one could wait for the hemoglobin to drop below seven grams before packed red blood cell transfusion. On the other hand, if the patient has ischemic cardiac disease, then it is better to start transfusion at a higher level rather than waiting it to drop to below seven. In that case, around eight or nine. The next step is to decide 
about endoscopy and uh, evidence suggests that the best outcomes are seen if endoscopy is performed within 24 hours after the onset of the bleeding. I've also learned a few things by uh, reading a little more in depth uh, because patients don't fall into one group. You may have a patient who is hemodynamically stable and has no comorbid illnesses. In that patient, it's probably better to scope them earlier because they are likely to have low risk also bleeds. Most likely they tend to have clean-based ulcers and if that's the case, they can be discharged home without prolonged hospitalization. We have learned that in patients who are unstable, uh, who have unstable hemodynamics, but without any comorbid illnesses, endoscopy between six to 24 hours after the onset of the bleed has been shown to have better protection in terms of mortality. On the other hand, if you have a stable patient, but someone who has serious comorbid conditions, it is better to take time to stabilize them and perform endoscopy. And the literature suggests that anywhere between 12 to 36 hours is reasonable. I want to make it a point here. That is, once you see somebody coming in with upper GI bleed, do not rush for emergency endoscopy. Instead, take time to stabilize the patient's hemodynamics and optimize the comorbid conditions and then perform endoscopy. Rushing to endoscopy prematurely without stabilizing the patient is likely to be harmful, except in very rare situations where you may want to have a diagnosis so that you can decide what to do next. For the most part, this principle helps. Once you decide about endoscopy, you want to make sure that your stomach is empty, the patient's stomach is empty of all the blood and clots. Consider using erythromycin, intravenous infusion, 250 milligrams over 30 minutes, typically given anywhere between half an hour to one and a half hours before the procedure. This empties the stomach and avoids the need for a second endoscopy because you could see the bleeding source and also offer therapy. Endoscopic therapy has been shown to be useful in patients with active bleeding ulcers and patients with visible vessel. Patients with clean-based ulcers and pigmented spots do not need any form of endoscopic hemostasis. As far as the group with a large clot, the guidelines have left it open for individual physicians to decide. Some tend to leave the clot alone and let nature he takes the healing course. Others try to take the clot out with a snare, find a vessel and treat the vessel. It all depends upon the local expertise and resources. Once you considered, once you applied endoscopic hemostasis, the next step is to prevent re-bleeding. And this can be achieved 
by intravenous PPI therapy, pantoprazole, given for 72 hours, starting with an 80 milligram IV bolus, followed by 8 milligrams an hour. If uh, infusion setup is hard due to local circumstances, in that case, you could consider giving 80 milligram IV bolus followed by 40 milligrams two to four times daily. After 72 hours, all patients who have received endoscopic hemostasis benefit from 40 milligrams of PPI twice daily for a total of 14 days. This has been shown to cut down rebleeding significantly. On the other hand, if the patient has a clean based ulcer or just pigmented spots and no endoscopic hemostasis was used, in that case, you could go with standard dose of 40 milligrams of PPI once daily. In the patient with a clot, where you did not decide to do endoscopic hemostasis, as far as I'm concerned, I would manage with an infusion followed by eight milligrams, eight, 80 milligrams bolus followed by eight milligrams hour infusion followed by 40 milligrams PPI twice daily. After 14 days, you continue a standard dose of PPI for anywhere between two to three months. And one needs to also decide the long-term management of the ulcer based on the risk factors for ulcer formation that need to be assessed, like checking the status of Helicobacter pylori, looking at the history and figuring out about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use, and in very rare cases, whether there is a hypersecretory status or state from zollinger ellison syndrome. That's very rare. I hope this is useful. Thank you.